You've got all your keywords. They're organized. Now we're ready to apply all of these keywords to our website. So let's look at the basics of search engine optimization. The key is taking all those keywords that you've researched and put them in key places on your web pages. The key here is not to just simply repeat a primary keyword over and over and over. You've got to approach this logically. As we saw with our keyword research, there are many different ways that people search, many different phrases that people use, and so we want to be able to encompass the amount of variations and words that people use and try and rank for many words, not just one word. So this is where your organization comes into play. Now the first thing to remember is that when we talked about search engines and how they go out and find web pages and they bring them back and they evaluate them in the algorithm, the important thing to remember is that search engines, they're blind. They can't see images. They don't read the text. They simply put it against a computer algorithm. And so it's very important to understand that search engines use the internet very similar to people that are using accessibility tools. You see, accessibility is a key concept in understanding search engine optimization. The W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium. And what they do is put together helps for people to understand accessibility online so that people who can't see, hear, or interact with computers, they use accessibility devices that enable them to interact with websites, such as braille keyboards, such as screen readers, things that make it easier for them to interact with websites. The more you make a website able to be used by a screen reader, text reader, braille keyboard, the more you're able to make it for a search engine to get through the site, because search engines have the same limitations. Now the W3C tells us in order to make our website accessible, that you need to provide a text equivalent for every non-text element. That means if you have an image, you have to name that image with text and let people know what that image is. Redundant text links are helpful. And we'll explain a little bit more how those can enable not just search engines, but users as well. And also, you want to use a natural language, and you want to identify any changes of that language. You also want to organize your documents so that even if you don't have the style sheet loaded, the text still renders on the page, because many accessibility devices do not apply the style sheet. Search engines look at your text on the page without the style sheet. You want to use clear, simple language. Make sure that your content is accessible. Anything that's contained in a Flash movie probably isn't accessible. Flash has come a long way, but it still isn't fully accessible. And also, when you link a page, you want to identify the target of that link using anchor text. So these are accessibility recommendations. It's very interesting that the Webmaster Guidelines are very similar to the World Wide Web Consortium's accessibility advice. Google's Webmaster Guidelines says that you should make a site with a clear hierarchy and text links, that you should have a site map with links that point to other pages, that you create a useful, information-rich website with pages that are clear and accurate about your content. Also, Google tells you to think about the words that people would type in to find your pages and that your site includes those words. I would highly recommend reading the Google Webmaster Guidelines. They're full of a lot of good information and a lot of advice for SEOs. Try to use text instead of images because Google doesn't recognize text in images. And also, make sure your title and alt tags are descriptive and accurate. We'll look at those as we talk more about optimization. So what I want you to understand as we move on is that search engine optimization is not simply repeating one word over and over and over and over in a page. Google even tells you, take into account the people that are reading your page, take into account how search engines work, take into account accessibility, and rely on the tools that are available to create compelling information 
using not just one word, but a multitude of words that describe your company, your business, your product, or the information you're trying to communicate. So, just to cover the basics, search engines want you to focus a page on a primary concept. People want you to focus a page on a primary concept. Don't try to rank for 20 different keywords with one page. Use a primary concept. Make sure that your context of that page supports the content. The keyword that you're trying to rank for has content on the page around it, and the search engines will create connections going beyond developing your keyword long tail and ensure that you familiarize yourself with some of the basic principles of accessibility so that you can understand a little bit better how search engines work. As you start optimizing your pages, the basic principle is putting keywords on the pages and primary places that people will read and that search engines will understand that these words and phrases are more important than other phrases. Page titles are the primary place that we're going to focus on. I believe that page titles are the most important piece of content on your page. I believe it's as much as 60 to 80% of the weight that search engines give to any content on the page, they put it on the page title. Because it shows up in the search engine results page, and because it shows up at the top of the browser, this is vitally important information. This is where you describe the content on your page, and you have 65 characters to do it. You see, if you're over that 65 character limit, give or take a few, your title gets cut off, and you receive the ellipsis there. People, as they're reading through the results, they're going to respond to a specific thought. They want to see what are my options as they are evaluating the page titles here. So there's a couple different things that you can do when you structure your title that will enable you to rank well. Now again, all search engine optimizers have come from very different backgrounds, and so we've all approached this very differently. The key here is to show you how many different ways you can structure your title and then you choose what works best for you. I like, obviously, the number one ranking because it's a full sentence. It describes specifically the content that's on that page, it uses the keyword of tennis racket, and then it has the brand name at the end. To me, that's the perfect title tag because it uses a complete sentence, which is very easy to read, the keyword, and then the brand name is at the end. I don't like putting the brand name first, as some other titles do, because I believe that you want your key words at the front, not your brand name. The second option here, you'll notice, has tennis rackets, tennis shoes, tennis apparel. They might offer all of these things, but as you'll notice, the title is longer than the character limit, and so it just seems to go on and on, listing keywords, and they are relevant but what are you trying to rank for on the home page? You see, what we're seeing here, and a couple other options, is just simply a list of keywords separated by a comma. People don't read lists as fast as they read sentences, which is why I still like that number one result. Now, this one is a little more specific. It's tennis rackets, and then we see brand names. I think that's a really good approach there, because if you do sell a lot of brand names, people respond to brands even though they may have searched for the general term of tennis rackets. Short titles tend to work very well. So when you are just simply stating what it is, it gives you a chance to rank very well. And even though this title does not include both keywords, such as tennis and rackets, just with racket and research and the content that's there enables it to rank well. Now the next three are all very similar, and we see keywords separated by a comma and keywords separated by a bar. Really the same thing, there's no difference. And like I said, it's up to you to determine what's going to be the best way for you to structure your title. The next important element of the page, and it's not the most important element for rankings, your meta description really does not affect your rankings that much. 
what it does do is provide a compelling reason for people to click on your result. This is the first marketing message a searcher will see about your company. So it's vital that you spend time developing a unique meta description for each page. Now in your meta description, it's a great place to put keywords because as you'll notice, the search word was tennis racket. So any place the word tennis or racket is used in the title or meta description or even the URL, you'll notice that it's bold. And when people look at the search results, what they're doing is scanning the search results very quickly to try and find the result that best matches their search. In eye tracking tests, what they have found is that people tend to keep their gaze in the upper left hand corner and then drift down and stay to the left. But those little red X's, those are the key words that are bolded in the results where people's eyes have stopped for just a moment. You see, as people are quickly browsing through the results, where their eyes are being drawn to are the key words that have the phrases that they're looking for. So your meta description is a way for you to reinforce the primary keyword, but also provide other words that are related, such as brand names, related product attributes, things that will enable people to know that you have more than just what you're optimizing for. The title is vitally important because if the title tag is exactly the same on every single page of your website, that's all you're going to rank for. There are many companies that all we have done in the optimization is change the title tag and within months they have doubled or tripled the amount of visitors they've gotten from search engines. It's that important. So just a quick review, the title tag shows up in the search engine results the top of the browser, the meta description comes from the code behind the page. Now one of the other things that I want to cover is the URL of the page. You see, Target had a problem. They weren't being spidered well because their URL was extremely long and complex. The more characters, letters, numbers, and the longer that URL is, the more of an obstacle it presents to the search engine. And so that's one key area that you want to keep in mind. And so you can see how Target has changed. Now they have named this page Baby Cribs. It's very simple. They've gotten rid of the long, complex URL and they've changed it to a simple word based URL. The word makes a lot more sense to humans and it makes a lot more sense to search engines as well because the URL also shows up in the search results. And if there is a keyword in the URL, it will show up as well. So not just your page URLs, but as you name your pages, .php or .html, or like this through a subdirectory, use keywords because that will resonate with both humans and search engines, and it also boosts your rankings capability. So these key page elements, the page title, which I said is probably about 80% of your entire page's relevancy. Everything else really just sort of is a percentage point or less added up. But as we're looking for context, the more you apply keywords into all these areas, the better off you'll be and the more relevance you'll create. So you wanna look at the page title, the page description, the page URL, the page headings, such as the headline, subheading, we'll get more into that. Also, any links that are on the page. Don't just link the URL, but use link text. Use words as you link to ascribe more value to the page and more context to what that link is about. And we're gonna dive very deeply into links in future chapters. Well, we've looked at some of the key elements of where to start optimizing and putting keywords onto the page. Let's look at some of the minor page elements. Now, again, these are very minor. They're only going to count for maybe a percentage point or a fraction of a point, but what we're looking for is context. These are places to really employ that rule of calling things what they are. 
let's look at a couple of places where we can employ these minor elements. The first is in the page name, the name of the page that's simply being displayed. We can also optimize the name of the file, an image, a document. Again, with images, I've seen so many images uploaded where it's simply the name that was assigned to it from the camera it was taken from, DSC110111, instead of calling the image what it is or the picture what it is. I'm also going to cover alt attributes and the meta keyword tag. A lot of people think that's still important, and it's not. Okay, let's start with file names. Anything that is a document, a PDF document, a Word document, an Excel spreadsheet, any type of document that you're allowing people to download off your website, you can optimize that. Call it what it is. So if it's your e-commerce white paper, put your brand name in there, name it PDF, and that will help assist the context of everything that is contained on that page. It will build link relevancy because you're linking to it. You can use words in that link as anchor text that also explain what it is. Again, what we're doing is creating context. We're looking at all the available places on the page that we can simply be clear about what things are. If you have a movie that people can watch, download, or that you're linking to, call it what it is. Rename the movie before you upload it and call it what it is. And flash elements. If you're using flash on the page, you can name the file what it is. And again, that helps with relevancy. Now, page names really is how you are displaying that page in the URL. This Best Buy site, in looking at a MacBook, it's pretty long and extensive. And while there are keywords in there, it's not memorable, and I wouldn't ever want to type that in. Now, let's compare that with the Apple site, where it's simply apple.com slash Mac. And the name of that page, the name of that file, is Mac. And so it's relevant to the information that's on the page. So again, keep your URLs short. Name the pages, the file name of that page, what it is. When it comes to images, like I said, don't just upload right out of your camera onto your website. Call it what it is. When people search for pictures of coffee, give them pictures of coffee. Most of them here, coffee.jpg, coffee beans jpeg, morning coffee jpeg, coffee cup jpeg. I think you get the picture. Now, an alt attribute is what you name an image, and that name will show up on the browser if the image doesn't load. Now, this is key for accessibility because people that are sight impaired won't see the image. However, a screen reader will read to them what the image stands for and what it's supposed to be. Beyond accessibility, I've been in many places where I'm just not getting a good enough Wi-Fi signal and the server times out and the image doesn't load. It's very critical if that image is a call to action button or provides some other relevant information. And so what you wanna do is in the alt attribute, and this is in the code, when you describe the picture, when you put the link to the image and the height and width of the picture, you can also in the alt attribute, name the picture, describe what it is, or the action that it will take. Give the user what they need to describe what this image is if it doesn't show up. Google is imperative in asking webmasters to use the alt attribute because Google puts a lot of emphasis on their image search and also it provides relevance. And so be sure you use that alt attribute to explain what the image is. Your media files are the same thing. You can get into the properties of your media file. You can rename the file to call it what it is, but then you can also in the properties put in a title, an author, a category, keywords, and a description, and that will stay in there as well, and that will get picked up by the search engines. Again, all of these things, they're not a magic way to gain rankings. All they're doing is helping you round out the contextual purpose of that page and the content that's contained in it. Now, the meta keyword 
is an element of code that really has built up a really bad reputation. You see, search engine optimization back in the 1990s was all about putting as many keywords into this field as possible. Because if you had a lot of keywords in there, it increased your chances to rank for those keywords, regardless of whether or not the content was on the page. This little piece of code was abused so much that right now, I don't think there is a search engine that uses the meta keyword tag to determine relevancy. If you want to take time to fill this out and put keywords in there, you're welcome to. But I have simply found that there are too many other and more important things that have more relevance on rankings than to take an hour or a couple hours to fill in keywords for every single page of the website. Very few, if any, search engines pay attention to it. And if they do, they don't pay much attention to it. So just to cover some of the minor page elements you want to keep in mind are the actual page names, file names, image names, alt attributes of your images, and if you want to, the meta keyword tag, but you're going to be asked about it, I guarantee it. Now, many times you can't directly work on a website, especially if you are a consultant or an independent, or if you have to work through a team of people, many times you have to develop a checklist or develop a plan for optimization, hand it over to someone else to be implemented. This is where developing a checklist enables you to view the site as a whole, optimize it on a spreadsheet. And so that way everything is organized and you know that all the key page elements are handled and are clear instructions to someone else who has to implement it. This is where I like having a mind map of the website. I like seeing the organization and the hierarchy of the site so that I can see the relationships of sections to other sections, pages to pages, and how everything is going to be organized. That way I can develop my plan around the groups of content. You see, I don't want to try to make every page rank for every word. I want to specify which words are going to be used in specific sections. And so we develop keyword families for a specific group, and then I assign a specific keyword to specific pages or groups of pages. That's when we develop the checklist and the spreadsheet to manage this. So we can identify first page is the home page. This is what the page title is going to be, the meta description, the headline, the H1, the H2, the H3, any images that are on that page, what the alt attributes will be, and what the primary keywords will be for that page. We can even go so far as adding what links will be there and what the anchor text. It's all up to you and how detailed you want to be in organizing all of your content and which pages will have a specific keyword focus or a family of keywords to focus on. So my category one page will be specific to that category of words, products, services, and I can assign all of the information there. And then if someone else will be implementing it, they have it all laid out for them. So it's important to do this and you're going to possibly run into a situation where you can't work directly on the website. So make sure that you have all the key elements on your spreadsheet Make sure that you identify what things are going to be headings, subheadings, and the code that you desire for those areas. Even any text, what text should be bold or italic, and what hyperlinks should be on the page as well. Make sure you identify what pages, what the file name should be, the alt attributes for images, your video, any multimedia, podcasts, or any PDF, or any spreadsheets that are there, Make sure those are documented in your spreadsheet as well, so you know which pages have which elements and what those elements should be called, the file name of those elements, and how they will be linked to. This way, you can ensure that your instructions can be communicated properly to whoever will be implementing the search engine optimization 
on each page. Search engine optimization plays a vital role in the development of contextual site architecture. You see, what people need when they come to a website is they need to know where they are at. In relation to the rest of the information around them, they need that clear sense of placement that here I am, I entered the site on this page, and realize that the majority of people are not going to enter your website at the home page. They're going to enter somewhere in your site that's not the home page, and they need to be able to know where they are at. They need to know that by the navigation, by the content, by the cues that are related information or links or other topics that are on the page. They also need to see what they want to do. So if there's a call to action or a way to get to the goal, they need to be able to see that. Otherwise, they're going to be frustrated. They're not going to know where they are or where to get the information that they want and they'll hit their back button and leave. So what we need to do is understand context. Context helps provide direction. When we use keywords in the architecture and navigation of the website, we help the user find what they want. Because if it isn't seen by the visitor, it doesn't exist. And so we need to show visitors where to go, what to do, and we can do that by using keywords in the navigation that present solutions. You see, when we use clear labels in our navigation, keywords, we provide confidence to the searcher that they have entered our website and they have found the right page for what they're looking for. And so developing a clear information architecture is based on your keyword research, and then it's based on taxonomy. Taxonomy is a word that simply means your method of organizing topics, your method of organizing the keywords that you have researched, and then you apply that into the architecture of the website. Here's a simple example. When we just look at the amount of ways that you can organize something as complex as wine, you can organize wine by color, by region, the type of grape, the price, the rating, what kind of wine it is. If you've ever gone into a wine store, I'm always fascinated by the ways they organize it, group it, present it. And so that's why I really like looking at a site like wine.com because they don't just present it one way, they organize it many different ways. And so you'll see in the bottom part of the page, top rated, most popular, recommended, collections, gift ideas, and one thing you'll notice is there's maybe only about five or six links in each group. This allows people to very quickly browse through the information that's there. It's got a bold heading. Some options have a little paragraph of text, but it makes it very quick for a person to read through, see what they want, and click on it. Opposed to that is this site from Cross Pens, and it seems to be just a mess of fonts and colors and cross-purpose messaging. But what really gets me is the navigation, where I can navigate the site by the product name. Well, if I don't know anything about the product name, then how am I supposed to navigate that? Or even navigate a pen site by fun and energy, comfort, beauty, classic. That's all really very subjective information. It's not clear. People are looking for objective information with which to make a decision on where do I click to go somewhere to get the information that I need. Now, I want to compare two websites from two very different parts of the country. The first one here is Breckenridge, Colorado. And we can come to this site and we get a sense that we are on the home page and there's a nice image there. But the problem is we really are not seeing where the main navigation is. Our eyes are drawn to the person fishing in the picture, and in the upper right, we see these icons, and we can distinguish what some of them are, but in the middle of the page is the main navigation. But because it's presented in such a low contrast method, we really can't see it over the other, more highly contrasting elements of the page. I'm going to show you one of the 
pages inside the Breckenridge site. And if you look up at the URL, you'll see that it's page.php and then the page name equals summer. But if you look at the headline of the page, it's the Snow Sculpture Championships taking place in January. If you look at the breadcrumb navigation just above that, it says home, summer, and events. So right away, we have a problem and the user will not have confidence using the navigation of this site because we have snow and summer put together and as we go through the site, we see this happening throughout. We see home, summer, activities, and then we see summer as another option. So the architecture of this site does not back up the content that's being presented. So even if you click on summer, now we start seeing some options here, but the navigation isn't consistent throughout the site and presenting the information or structure of the information that gives much confidence. As an example, in Rapid City, we can look at this website and we can see the navigation across the top and we know that we're on the home page because the home option is darker than the rest of the other options. And when you click on visitors, visitors becomes darker than the other options as well. When you click on things to do, you'll notice here that there is a difference in font size and in the color of the navigation. We're in visitors, we're in things to do, and we're on the outdoor recreation page. That's reinforced by the breadcrumb navigation at the top of the content. It's reinforced by the navigation. Outdoor recreation has a visual indicator of an arrow next to it. And we can clearly see the hierarchy of outdoor recreation is a subcontent of things to do because things to do is a larger font. And we can also see the related content immediately under, such as parks and monuments, shopping, golf, and sightseeing. So when we click on parks and monuments, that's now the more obvious visual indicator of what page we're on and the relation of that page to the content around it. This navigation instills confidence. It's clear, it's concise, and it uses keywords to help us understand where we are in relation to the rest of the content, and it shows us where we need to go to accomplish what we're looking for. A good way to develop a navigation is to do what's called a card sort. And really a card sort is just what it sounds like. Get a bunch of index cards or sticky notes and write down every topic that you have on your website, every topic, every page, and then sit down and start organizing it. Create logical groupings of content and then create a label that describes that group of keywords. And what you'll have is a clearly organized topical presentation of your website. So you want to make sure that you're using the right words throughout in both your topics and your organization of those topics and the labels that you are using. You see, when you have a clear hierarchy to present to the user, they'll understand what the main idea is and the groups that you are using and the specific product information and the links that you are using all will make sense as they all surround the main idea and the contextual presentation of information for each group that you are working through and how it relates to other groups and how people can find information throughout the website. So when you are using contextual architecture, it reinforces the accomplishment of the visitor. It lets them know that they've come to the right place, they have found the right things, and a clear navigation will help them have that sense of location that they're in the right place. You can clarify the visitor's activity on your website by using clear keywords as labels and as words in the navigation and the organization of your navigation to let them know that they're in the right place. And this will also benefit you in search engine optimization as well. By making clear labels and navigation, it also enables the search engines to organize your content and see the relevancy of your content as a whole across the entire website.
In this chapter, we're going to be reviewing search engine optimization tools that you can use that will manage not only your optimization, but sometimes your keywords, your rankings, and also provide helpful instruction to improve your website for rankings. We're going to be looking at Linkdex in this lesson and the features that it has to help you manage your site effectively. The first thing I like to point out is the keyword ability here on Linkdex. You can search for keywords to add to your project and into your keyword management simply by looking for words that are similar and clicking search. It will show you words that are similar to what you're looking for. You can also filter out different keywords. You can look for different competition levels or look for a specific threshold on estimated Google searches so that you don't waste time with keywords that only bring in maybe one or two visitors a month. You can also connect link decks to your Google Analytics. In that way, you can get a sense of how many visitors you have received and how many visitors Google estimates search for that keyword. We'll show that in the rankings. But I can go through here and I can look specifically for keywords that are relevant to my project and add them to what I'm doing. I can go through and get many keywords and many variations that are added and that's one of the ways that Linkdex will help you build the keywords that you want for these tasks. Now let's go look at the rankings tab and this will show you your phrases and you can pick about five to ten that will show the trend for the past 90 days. There's going to be some volatility once in a while for certain terms but they tend to go right back to where they are I don't put a lot of stock in the ranking report. What I'm more interested in is this information down here when it comes to rankings. Let's look at the top term. For Classic Beetle, I rank number four, and that's up number one from the last time that rankings were checked. Because this forward slash is here, that lets me know that my home page is the page that ranks for that key phrase. Now these little icons are very helpful because they let you know what other competition is showing up on the search engine results page. The play button means that there are video results for that keyword. The camera means that there are images showing up for that keyword. And the four shows the amount of paid ads that are showing up in the search engine results. So even though I have a number four ranking, I know that there are four paid results, there are image results, and a video result. So I've got a lot of competition for that keyword besides the other organic rankings that are on the page. Here's where it ties into my analytics, and it shows me that on average about 600 people search for that phrase every month, and I received 88 out of those estimated number of searches. So as I go through and look at all of my keywords, one of the things I'm very interested to know when I get to the bottom of the page is looking at all of the keywords that I'm tracking. I'm looking at about 861 visits, but based on the amount of visits and the keywords that I'm ranking for, Linkdex is estimating that the value of all my rankings and key phrases in the rankings is about $3,500 a month because if I were bidding on those terms in Google, it would be costing me well over a million dollars. So what the total media value means is that because I'm organically ranking for these words, I'm saving about $3,500 a month because of my organic rankings, and I'm not paying for those keywords. If I were bidding on those keywords, that's how much I'd be spending for the ranks and the keywords that I've been bringing in. This also means that I have a potential of saving much more money based on if I held rankings for each of the terms, based on all the estimated searches that are taking place, that I could be saving the equivalent of a few hundred thousand dollars. Let's go into the content tab. Because this is where Linkdex really excels, is in helping you understand what's going on with your website by each individual page. So for example, looking at this article here, my local Beetle Graveyard, it tells me that I have three outstanding issues. I've got 255 internal links, 31 links going out, no external links coming from other sites to this specific page, and in this period, no visits have been counted. But what I can look at is my performance the past 30 days, and it lets me know that I am missing an element, that I have a duplicated title and a duplicated H1 tag. 
And so that lets me know that I've got to do something to change that. And what I like about Link Dex is the workflow. I can add that as a task to take care of the duplicated issue. I assign that to myself so that it will get done. I assign a due date to get that done tomorrow. And then I'll save that. And that's now added into my workflow here on Link Dex. It lets me know the link performance. And then as I scroll down, it gives me a layout of the page so that I can see the title, the H1, any H2s, the images that are on the page, and what attributes are being used in those images. So it lets me know a clear direction that I need to follow in order to improve every single page and every single element of every page on the site. This has been a tour of LinkDex. I hope you enjoyed it. And for my money, I think it's probably one of the best tools out there to manage your keywords and manage your site.